All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we've got uh, something a little different. My student, Alid, has uh, decided we need to be able to pulse a laser very fast and very intensely. It turns out, though, that while you can buy things that do that, they're expensive. So Alid's made, out, made a pretty cool board that allows um, us to do this um, uh, cheaply. So we're going to show you how this works as we assemble it. We're going to hope it works. And we'll also post some files in case anybody wants to replicate this design. All right, so basically how this works is we have plus 200 volts in here. Uh, this goes through a diode, just to make sure the current's flowing the right way. And we have over here what's called an avalanche break breakdown transistor. So basically what this is, this is a transistor where it's off most of the time, but when it starts to conduct, you have electrons going through the, the transistor body and then they start knocking other electrons off the silicon. It's not normally a regime you want to operate a transistor in because it usually blows them out, but if you do it for a couple nanoseconds, that's fine. And this transistor is specifically designed to have an avalanche breakdown of about 80 volts, which is what I suspect we'll have to charge this to to get the avalanche effect. Uh, so that lets us put through a very, very short, very, very high current pulse through this network of resistors and capacitors which shape that pulse. That goes through a laser die, which will be mounted here. But on the back of the board, we have these resistors here. So these are very small resistors and we have all of them wired in parallel. So basically when we have, you know, 30 amps going through these resistors, we'll get a pulse that's about a volt out. And so that pulse will come out on here and we'll be able to see how much current we're putting through the diode, see that our pulsar is working, and then we can estimate how much power we're putting out. Um, then all over here, we just have a bunch of circuitry so that instead of having to put, you know, 200 volts in manually with some expensive power supply, we can generate it with a buck loose converter from uh, just a 12 volt DC barrel jack, which is pretty normal. Um, and that's basically the whole circuit. It's not very complicated, and I'm hopefully, hopeful that it'll work because um, this, this circuit's been, you can see different papers of people doing this for decades. It's a pretty common circuit people use to do this. All right. So first thing I'm doing is I'm doing a, uh, just a manual paste application. So everywhere where I'm going to populate a component that I'm going to solder down, I'm going to put some solder paste there. And then after I put all the solder paste, we'll go through and populate all the components that we're soldering. Uh, this board has a backside for, iso for an opto isolator to isolate the pulse input from the actual 200 volt circuit. For now, we're not going to populate that and we'll just use a pulse generator we don't mind blowing up because uh, it just adds extra complexity to the board. These are the big beefy capacitors that the switching regulator uses to charge up to 200 volts. So we have a couple of these basically switched in and out of the circuit by diodes, and that lets you basically take a 12 volt input and pump it up to up to 200 volts. Um, this is a pretty standard boost converter circuit. These SMAs, this pulse and isolated we won't use, but we might as well populate it now just so the board sits kind of nice and flat if we flip it over and decide to populate the backside. Um, so it might look like there's a lot of bare copper on here, but I've actually ordered this board with a clear solder mask. Uh, so the, the copper you see here is covered with a, with a clear coat that, that is uh, not conductive. So we're, we're good on that front. We're not going to shock ourselves just by you know, touching any old part of the board, although obviously at 200 volts you don't want to touch it a lot. But on Oshpark, this is the same price as a regular purple PCB, and I think it looks a lot cooler. So anytime I'm doing a two-layer, this is what I usually order. So you have a little solder crossing over there. You probably can't see it on camera, but that's fine. The, the solder mask, which in this case is clear, will basically, the, it's solder phobic. So it'll wick it, the solder will most part wick itself back onto the pads, even if I don't do the perfect paste application. And then anywhere that there is a mistake, I can go clean it up by hand with a soldering iron pretty easily and some wick. My left over here, we have um, a very useful keycap plugin. I recommend if you're ever assembling a board by hand called a, iBomb to HTML, and basically it just makes a little website from your board that you can just click on and it'll um, give you the part number and the location and everywhere that same part is populated. You can link in the data sheets, you can link in the, um, you can, you know, link it to like the, in this case I've linked in the DigiKey part number, so I can just look at a bag and then control F and find the place on the board. That's pretty handy. And for that reason, I'll often forego reference designators on the board itself, just to make it a little cleaner. Now it's not, I know that's a little bit of a controversial thing to do, but I tend to prefer it that way. 
All right, so now we move on to placement. Um, so I've got, you know, I like to start with any active components, i.e. anything that's, you know, not a passive, it's got some semiconductor in it somewhere. So I'll start with all the diodes and the um, various ICs that we've got on here. Um, so first, the first diode I opened is a Shockey diode, and I will go look for where that is on the board. You can see there's, you probably can't see that, but there's a little bar on there. Then the MPN transistor. Um, I bought a couple of these because we're gonna, we're gonna be putting a lot of current through them and there's a decent chance we'll blow up one. Next is the charge pump. Here is the charge pump. All right, so the very boring part where I just quickly sort all my capacitors and resistors, and I can sort the components by their value here and then easy. I just have, I go through my stack, I look where it is, I place the resistor. So this form is part of the voltage divider along with some variable resistor, with some uh, potentiometers, which gets us a tunable voltage, um, which is handy because we don't know, we won't know the exact breakdown voltage of this uh, transistor. So I have two ranges on here, one that's, you know, zero to 70 or 80 and one that's like 50 to 200. Uh, just so you can tune them fairly finely. And these resistors, it's basically never a big power resistor. Unless it's a big power resistor, they're basically uh, don't cost any more to buy 10 than it costs to buy two. So I'll often buy 10 or more. And then we have a reel so we can use it either A, if we lose something, or B, if we uh, make another board, we don't have to order that same batch of component again. That one there is part of the charging network. And then we have all these zero ohms and the pulse shaping network. We might replace these with like, you know, 0.5 ohms or something, depending on how the pulses look. Although there's a sense resistors in the back, which probably are plenty of resistance to kind of get the kind of pulse shape of, you know, 10 to 100 nanoseconds that we're looking for. So I'm gonna place these big chunky capacitors down. All right, so now we're gonna reflow so I'm gonna use a hot air gun for this, even though we have a hot plate. So you can see when the solder melts, it pulls the components into place, even if they're not placed perfectly. And it also retracts from the parts of the board where there are not holes in the solder mask. I had a tombstone there. So there are a couple places I need to do some touch up. Uh, some of these bigger capacitors, I didn't give them quite enough paste. And there was so much heat sinking on the ground on this connector that the ground pin didn't really reflow. So I'll do that with the iron. All right, so we got this all set up in the white lab um, with the uh, blue fridge. Um, so we're hoping to test this on a real device soon. Um, but for now, I'm just going to make sure this works. I'm going to turn it on. The pulse generator is currently set to 360 hertz. So we should see a neat beating of the pulses with the frame rate of the camera. And we'll see that in a second. All right, I'm going to crank the repetition rate up. And we sh because the, each pulse is going to have the same magnitude, but we should see, as I crank the repetition rate up, we should see it get brighter because it's, it's a higher duty cycle. We got the rep rate up to six kilohertz, so you should be able to see that pretty easily. So here we can see the laser pulses as they come out of the um, laser diode beating with the camera frame rate, which is 60 hertz. Um, uh, I have the laser pulse set to a rep rate of 600 hertz. 
Uh, you can see that if I move it further away from the camera frame, right? Suddenly, the laser should appear more normal. Yep, because I've been, now it's not a nice multiple of the camera frame, right? Before it was a 10 times the camera frame, right? And now it's, you know, I'm at 1.6 kilohertz, which is not a nice multiple of 60 hertz. Back to 60 hertz, and we're back to seeing the laser pulse move backwards because it's not perfectly synced with the camera. All right, so we got this laser turned on. We got this laser hooked up here in the white lab. Um, up here, we have the scope shot. So up here, this is showing the trigger uh, that's running at six kilohertz right now with, I believe, a 10 microsecond um, pulse length. Now, the actual pulse is going to be much less than that because we're using a pulse generated by some charged up capacitors that we're suddenly discharging through the laser. Uh, but that's the, pull, that's the trigger there, so that's running at 6 kilohertz. And then we've got the voltage on the boost converter here, which is actually charging those capacitors. That's set to around 200 volts right now. And so when I plug this in, on the bottom here, where we have the uh, current waveform, you can see currently it's off. When I turn this on, we should see a pretty large deviation downwards there. And so that should tell us we're putting about 30 to 50 amps through this laser diode, which is way more than what it's rated for. And so if I plug this in, yep, so we can see... Uh, some ringing because of the just because of the amount of current being drawn and the magnitude of this pulse and We see this this uh, laser pulse here. And if I zoom in on the horizontal scale, we can see These laser pulses see I am on um, 20 nanoseconds per division. So this laser pulse is about uh, 10 nanoseconds long So that's perfect for what we're doing here We're trying to measure see how many photons we can pack into a single pulse and then see if we can resolve those photons with the M kits. And so 10 nanosecond pulse with high enough power that you can see by eye um, means that we're, we're getting pretty close to something that we can, we can test these M kits with. So yeah, you can see we're at 194 volts here. So I'm going to unplug that because it's dangerous. All right, so we got this thing working. Um, once we go to device cold in the fridge, I think we'll, it'll be really interesting to see if how many photons we can get out of this in a single pulse. We'll have a link to the GitHub repo with the design for this in it. Um, it'll be have that one component fixed, and uh, maybe um, the, the, I have a footprint I need to fix as well, so that it's clearly marked which end of the laser diode is positive. That'll be on the you know, you'll be able to find that in the description. Um, there'll be a, and if you want to build this, uh, the bomb cost is under a hundred dollars, so that's pretty good for you know something that can pulse a laser. At I, I need to figure out what the peak power output here is, but it's it's like you know, in the dozens of watts in a single pulse. Um, so yeah, that's pretty exciting.